Welcome to the Press Box Podcast. My name is Dave Nichols of the Spokesman Review. I'm joined today by my colleague Theo Lawson of the Spokesman Review. He covers uh, Gonzaga men's basketball and several other assignments when available, but he is rarely, rarely available for other assignments because he's almost full time even during the summer covering Gonzaga. So welcome to the program, Theo. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's uh, um, the Zags got off to a, a roaring start Monday night. Um, kind of a um, unexpected roaring start, right? I mean, these are two top 10 programs battling each out and it, and it, and it turned into a 35 point blowout or whatever. Yeah, yeah, 38 points at the end. Uh, obviously, Gonzaga took a pretty big lead early um, with the starting lineup, and then actually their bench was able to kind of expand the lead. Uh, Dusty Strummer and Braden Huff scored 17 straight points at, at one point in the first half. So um, even with their bench unit, they, they were able to keep uh, growing that lead, and um, it just got to a point where uh, in the second half, nothing Baylor could do uh, was, 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 was working, and offensively they couldn't get any um, kind of rhythm or flow. And defensively, I, th- I thought the Zags were a lot better than um, I expected, especially after seeing them, um, you know, eight days earlier, give up 96 points in an exhibition to USC. So um, re- really, really impressive start. That was a Baylor team that um, had a few transfers, had a had a had a freshman playing his first game, VJ Edcom- Edgecombe. So um, got kind of kind of given those circumstances in a in a hostile road atmosphere, um, it, it, it was a tough uh, tough situation for Baylor. So. Um, Nonetheless, uh, uh, that, that, that's about as good as, as you could expect from Gonzaga in the first game. This uh, Gonzaga Baylor rivalry really has turned into a rivalry. The rivalry the last couple of years, hasn't it? Yeah, if you if you go all the way back to even before um, the national championship game, uh, Gonzaga and Baylor met in the NCAA tournament. Um, I believe it was 2019. The team with Brandon Clark and Rui Hachimura. Right. Um, Gonzaga won that game, and, and I think people kind of forget about that game because they they focus on that 21 national championship game. Obviously, Gonzaga goes in with an undefeated record. Um, Baylor really just sets the tone early in that game, and, and Gonzaga never really had a chance in that title game after you know winning that epic uh, Final Four game against UCLA. Um, and, and, and then uh, two years later, they decided to play a neutral site game in Sioux Falls, South Dakota um, in, in December. And um, Gonzaga actually led by seven points in the final two minutes of that game. Baylor comes back and um, makes a few three-point shots in the final two minutes and, and uh, edges Gonzaga out 64-63. And um, it sounds like Mark Few and Scott Drew, who, who are really good friends and pickleball buddies, mm-hmm. um, they hang out in the offseason. Scott Drew has been up to... Um, Mark View's Lake House before, and so so they're they're really good friends. They they've actually been talking about getting some kind of series going since that fi- since that national championship game, and um, it, it didn't really work out to to start that three year series until this year. So this will be the first of three games. Uh, we don't have dates or locations um, um, regarding the next two, but I imagine there's going to be one in uh, Texas, probably closer to Baylor's campus, like last night was close to Gonzaga, and then and then another neutral site game, I imagine. Neutral and neutral, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe a Las Vegas or a Phoenix or something sure. like that. Yeah. Um, do you think that this type and this is jumping more ahead of our conversation that I wanted to get? But do you think that this type of rivalry survives moving into the Pac-12 or Pac-10 or whatever it's going to be? Yeah, I think uh, I think Gonzaga won't have to be maybe as aggressive with the non-conference schedule as, as they like to be with Mark Few. Uh, you know, Mark Few has this kind of mantra of any um, any team, any time, anywhere. Um, right. I, I think he'll he'll maintain that. I, I think Gonzaga still needs to be a team that schedules strong non-conference opportunities. Um, he's he's open to to, to playing uh, again anybody. I mean, he's he's played Michigan State on a. Uh, on a uh, naval uh, <laughs> uh, aircraft carrier, right. um, you know he's he's gone to Kentucky. You know he's he's played this game now with Baylor. So um, I think Gonzaga will still try to you know seek out these games. Maybe you'll have five instead of six um, once they join the Pac-12 with with the stronger uh, st- uh, strength of schedule and, and and the better opportunities. But um, hopefully. You know, uh, Gonzaga, Baylor, teams like this can can still play these games. Uh, a, lot, a lot of teams, a lot of coaches aren't willing to play a game like this on opening night. There aren't really any top twenty-five matchups in college basketball on opening night. A lot of a lot of coaches, especially now with new teams and the transfer portal, like to ease into the season with with their new rosters and play a few games that they they're going to win by thirty right. points right. before playing this game. So so really, uh, you know, um, a lot of credit to Mark Few and Scott Drew for playing this game, uh, knowing that one of these teams, these these top ten. Teams Teams was going to take an opening day loss and um, getting that out of the way. Just, just also knowing that you're going to be able to make up for for a loss here because you have a whole season ahead of you. What's more impressive from coming out of Monday night, the 101 points scored or 63 points allowed? 
Uh, for me, definitely, it's the it's the sixty three points led. I, I think coming into the year, everyone knew Gonzaga had the 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 um, the potential to be a really explosive offense with with everything they return, and then adding you know the the second leading scorer in the WCC and, and Michael Jaye, and then adding a kind of a microwave score and Caleb Battle from Arkansas, mm-hmm. um, both kind of known for what they can do offensively. So um, I, I think the big question, especially after that USC um, exhibition, was the defense and last season Gonzaga. Um, failed to kind of crack the top 50 and adjust the defense, according to Ken Palm. And uh, most teams that play in the national championship game are usually a top 20 defensive team mm-hmm. and, and also probably a top 20 offensive team. But uh, normally you have to kind of be in that top 20 to top 30 to be in the mix at the end of the year. Um, Gonzaga knew that, and, and uh, you know I, I think even with the offense, they, they still had to make a, a pretty big jump. And um, they lost their best defender, Anton Watson, who was largely drafted by you know, the reigning champion Celtics for his defense mm-hmm. and, and the versatility. So um, when you take a pretty mediocre defensive team by Gonzaga standards, lose your best defender from that team, how do you expect to make a jump? And, you know, they, they, they obviously did. Uh, you know, you, you'll have to kind of see it uh, moving forward against, uh, you know, San Diego State and some of the mm-hmm. other teams on mm-hmm. this uh, this really loaded non-conference schedule. But but this is a, a, a very good start. And, again, holding Baylor to, to 63 on, you know, 14% from the three-point line, under 40% from the field. Um uh, 12 turnovers, that, 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 that's a pretty good start for Gonzaga. You mentioned the three-point defense because I think that's been an Achilles heel for this team in years past. Mm-hmm. Is um, They've had pretty good interior defense but, uh, but are open to the outside shot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if 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 you look at the the last team that made the the national title game, um, that was a really good team in in, in terms of perimeter defense. When when, when you have guys like uh, Andrew Nemhard, who's who's a bigger guard, Jalen mm-hmm. Suggs, who's who's coming off an all all uh, defensive year in the NBA, even Corey Kispert, Joel Ayaye, um, Anton Watson. That, that that was a team that really defended the perimeter well. But since then, um, I don't think that's been a, a strength of Gonzaga. And, and you know, again, when you looked at the, look at this team, bringing back kind of the same guards and and, and then adding Caleb Battle, who's known for for his offense and his defense, um, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you certainly did uh, wonder how this team would fare defending the perimeter, um, giving up open threes. But but certainly last night they, they they did a good job. Baylor probably missed a few more open threes than than, than they would like, and um, I think this will be a Baylor team that shoots a lot better moving forward. Um, but still, kind of limiting those opportunities and, and, and contesting a lot of the shots really um, is is kind of what limited Baylor to, to three of twenty one last night. You know, I didn't sit there and watch every minute of the game last night. I was flipping back and forth with the football game and got wrapped up during overtime. But every time I flipped on uh, the Zags, uh, Battle had the ball in his hands or he was knocking a ball away on the defensive end. So he was kind of the guy that, that kind of stood out to me last night. Yeah, he, he he wasn't very assertive early on with his shot. Um, he, he's kind of known for for being a high volume shooter at Arkansas. He uh, t- uh, toward the end of the year he had a stretch where he scored 30 points in, in, in three straight games against uh, SEC opponents. So so he's kind of known for hunting his shots, but but wasn't doing doing a lot of that early on. But was still uh, making an impact defensively. Uh, he, he had probably Gonzaga's defensive highlight, uh, spiking a ball away from um, I believe it was uh, VJ Edgecombe from from mm-hmm. Baylor. I, I could be wrong there, but. Uh, Spiked it right into right into Nolan Hickman's hands, and, and Nolan kind of um, finished uh, with 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 the breakaway transition basket there. So so he made an impact with the defense early, rebounded well, uh, didn't make a lot of mistakes, and then later on um, he started kind of looking for a shot and, and actually scored nine points in about uh, 60 seconds and, and made three straight threes. And you can you can kind of see that the, the, the microwave uh, scoring ability he has, and he's going to be someone whether he's starting um, or coming off the bench that, that that's going to be really explosive and just a kind of another cog cog. For for this offense that, that that can really make them go. The last 20 seconds here, I've just been scrolling up and down the roster. Um, where's the weak spot? Yeah, I mean, I, I would have told you uh, last night before the the, the game is, is is the defense, <laughs> but right. but again, uh, that I, 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 would, I was proven wrong. Uh, obviously, uh, in, in that game, they'll have to, to, to continue to do that. But um, if you if you just look at uh, position wise, I mean, they they have uh, a potential top five, top ten point guard in the country. I think I would I would consider Nolan Hickman one of the top twenty five shooting guards. Um, again, Caleb Battle is, is 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 a proven six year player who, who scored a lot in a power conference last year. And and, and uh, at the wing spot, Michael Ajayi is probably the best NBA prospect on this team. You know, mm-hmm. had a, had a chance to um, participate in the draft combine, had his name in the draft, pulled it out the last day, came back to, to Gonzaga for for another year. Or so, um, and then and then the front court is is loaded too. Uh, Graham Ike, again another one of the best kind of. Uh, 
back to the basket, big men in the sport. Um, reminds you a lot of uh, uh, Drew Timmy, just kind of in the way he goes about things. They're different players, but uh, both very reliable when you throw the ball into them. That mm-hmm. you, you feel very good about them scoring down there. So Ben Gregg has made another step. So, so they, they just have a ton of versatility. And then, and then if you if you want to talk about their depth, Dusty Stromer and, and Braden Huff coming off the bench, as well as um, Ajayi last night coming off the bench. I, I just think it's a really really deep team that doesn't have one. One weakness per se, um, you know, I, I think the rim protection is going to be something that if, if, if they're playing um, a team with a better uh, front court um, talent than the, than the Baylor had last night, I, I think that could be something where um, this team doesn't have the the shot blocking of Chet Holmgren or Brandon Clark. So mm-hmm. look for that going forward if they're if they're playing some some bigger teams. But aside from that, um, you know, I, 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 I couldn't necessarily point to one <laughs> to one weakness on this team. Um, they don't have the clear cut first round NBA, uh, you know, draft guy like like, like a Jalen Suggs or a Chet Holmgren. But I'm not sure that that really matters when you have a bunch of fourth year, fifth year, sixth year guys who who have a bunch of uh, college experience. Right. It's uh, it's kind of an interesting roster construction, right? Because mm-hmm. the uh, the last couple of years it has skewed younger, but now it's skewing older. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. And and, and uh, you know, it's I, I I think when you look at uh, the the best teams in college basketball now, every, everyone wants the five star freshmen, the Cooper flags, mm-hmm. guys like that. But um, those guys typically aren't the reason that teams win a national championship. It it is it is usually a very experienced team with maybe one or two of those freshmen who mm-hmm. who can come in and make an impact. If you look at last year's UConn team, they had one of those guys in uh, Stephon Castle, but right. that was generally an experienced team with 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 really good sophomore and Donovan Klingon and, and and some really kind of experienced uh, juniors and seniors. So I think I think uh, in terms of winning at the college level, um, you, you'd rather have four or five uh, fifth year guys than than four or five freshmen who who've never played college basketball, even though they might be you know one and done prospects who are going to be in the NBA pretty soon. Right. Um, is there a wild card on this team? Is there someone that maybe might step into a role that we're not envisioning at this point? Yeah, I think I, I think you know we, we talk about this team and it, it really is kind of an eight man rotation right now. But I think there's a ninth guy who um, who who's kind of intriguing and, and that's uh, Manuel Inocenti. He's he's a sophomore, uh, born in Italy, played last year at Tarleton State. Um, was was all uh, all defensive team in the in, in the Western Athletic Conference and, and all freshman team. So didn't play at a, didn't play at a great school, didn't play in a great league. But he's a very intriguing athlete. He's long. He, he he's he's kind of a um, it's supposed to be an elite defender, so so if mm-hmm. if they ever do get in trouble with the perimeter defense, I think he's someone who who could come in and and, and guard uh, more athletic, uh, uh, bigger bigger wings, bigger guards if if need be. So so I'm I'm just curious to see. Um, I think in some of these games in non-conference uh, um, against uh, you know against the likes of UMass Lowell and Bucknell and, and some of these schools, he, he's probably going to get a little bit a little bit more floor time, and we'll see if he's someone who who can kind of uh, uh, maybe not crack the rotation, but you know every few games if they need a guy uh, if, if they kind of need a defensive stopper, um, if nothing else, you know that, that that's a few more fouls that you can give out. So um, he's he's intriguing. I I think the other eight guys that, that we've talked about are kind of known quantities, but mm-hmm. Emmanuel is kind of unknown right now, and, and I'm not sure. He's going to be able to crack a, a, a crack the rotation um, if, if it stays if, if it kind of stays as eight eight players. But um, he's he's kind of the wild card and, and someone that um, could make an impact later on. Gotcha. Um, let's take a look at the schedule a little bit. Um, just off the top of your head, what are the top three games that that Zags fans can't miss? I would say uh, UConn is is probably the highlight. Uh, UConn in um, in New York, uh, New York City, Madison Square Garden. That, that's kind of the th- it's going to be the third time in three years those those two schools have met. Um, Gonzaga is still looking for a win against UConn a- mm-hmm. a- after kind of getting run out of the building the last two times playing that uh, play, playing those national championship UConn teams. So so I would say that game is probably number one. Um, if they make the championship of the battle for Atlantis, they could play Tommy Lloyd in Arizona. Obvious connections there with 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 Tommy and a lot of members right. of his staff. Um, I, I I would say that that's pro- maybe even tied for number one with UConn if if they do play Arizona. Both teams obviously have to win two games before getting to that championship game. And then and then the third the third game, you know you you could you could pick a number of games. I would probably still go with Kentucky, uh, December seventh at at Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle. Um, Gonzaga hasn't won at Climate Pledge yet. They they've played Alabama there. They've played UConn there. Mm-hmm. Haven't won a game in Seattle um, in that in that newer building and. 
obviously that the series with Kentucky has kind of gone Gonzaga's way so far, but Kentucky has a new coach, uh, Mark Pope, who Gonzaga knows well with uh, with BYU. Mm-hmm. Um, so so that, that that'll be a pretty interesting matchup with with a new kind of Kentucky system roster coach. We'll see how uh, Gonzaga fares in that in, in that game too. And those three games all could come back to back to back, right? Arizona and then Kentucky and Connecticut. That's kind of a kind of a gauntlet heading into the holidays there. It is, yeah. So so the the the, the Arizona game could be November 29th. Uh, thankfully, there's uh, a week off between that game and 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 the Kentucky game, and then really another week off between that game and the and, and the UConn game. But um, yeah, it's it's a really strong non-conference uh, portion of uh, a strong portion of the non-conference schedule. Those three games in a row, they, they they play a few more softer games before playing kind of kind of their last marquee non-conference game in UCLA. Um, I'm interested to watch. Uh Watch them play Nichols, obviously. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> we're, actually we're that's actually Nichols the that highlight night. of the non-conference schedule. I should have said that one first. Right, exactly. Um, schedule conference. Um, who do they have to be worried about? Yeah, I, I actually think it's a pretty deep year for 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 the WCC, especially now adding uh, Washington State and Oregon State. It, it really kind of brings up the bottom of that league a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, 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 there's kind of more meat on the bone there. Right. Um, uh, they, you know, they, these aren't teams that are expected to be tournament teams per se, and and and, and Wazoo and Oregon State, but um, it's uh, they, they're, 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 they're certainly teams that aren't that aren't going to be in the you know the two two fifty to three hundred range and mm-hmm. Ken Palm like some of these other WCC teams have been traditionally. So um, it kind of just adds some more pop. To the, to, to the to the schedule and obviously for Gonzaga, um, having kind of the local rivalry with Wazoo back is going to be really good. I think for 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 the Inland Northwest and really really exciting for both fan bases. Both of those games and in, in Spokane and Pullman are going to be really exciting. But um, I, I, I uh, you know we we ran our preseason predictions in, in the uh, in the preview section uh, a couple days ago and I picked St. Mary's second in the conference because. Mm-hmm. Uh, despite how much they lost, um, you know, Aiden Mahaney going to UConn, Josh Jefferson going to Iowa State, uh, losing Alex Dukas, uh, a lot of losses. But Randy Bennett somehow always finds a way to to figure it out by the end of the year. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people were worried about St. Mary's during during non conference last year, and they they managed to put together a team that won both uh, both WCC titles and, and and got a good seat in the tournament. So um, I'm I'm still thinking St. Mary's is, is going to be the toughest team to um, to deal with, just uh, also also because of the way they play their style. Randy Bennett knows how to play against Gonzaga. He's mm-hmm. he's done it more than anyone in the country. So, um, you know, I they're 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 my, they're my preseason um, kind of runner up in the WCC, and then after that, uh, Santa Clara uh, beat beat Gonzaga last year at home. So the, the, that's going to be a team that returns pretty much everyone from last year's team. Adds a really good guard in Carlos Stewart. So they're 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 going to be really really solid and really really tough to beat too. Um, I, I think San Francisco is kind of the other team that makes in the top four that that I would worry about if I were Gonzaga. They they probably have. The best backcourt in the conference, other than Gonzaga, so mm-hmm. um, that, that that's going to be another uh, another tough game, both uh, both when they play in Spokane and, and play down at the Chase Center, actually in San Francisco. It's um, you mentioned Washington State and building a rivalry there. Obviously, um, Spokane is full of Coug fans, and Pullman is is full of Zags fans just mm-hmm. because they haven't had this conflict before. Uh, maybe get into the, that dynamic a little bit, right? Because um, it, it's been it's been one giant college basketball fandom in this area. Now it's going to be divided loyalties when these time teams play. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that, that root for WCU's football team and then root for Gonzaga's basketball team. Right. So so I, I'll, I'll be curious to see how those people, uh, you know, I, I'm sure most of those people will still Root for the Zags when those games come around, but you know I, I covered Washington State my first uh, four years at the at the Spokesman, and you know that that was uh, not too too long after Gonzaga kind of decided to discontinue the series with WCU. They mm-hmm. they just kind of didn't really see a sense in, in putting WCU on the schedule because those weren't very good WCU teams. It didn't right. really add much, and, and, and you know uh, Gonzaga wasn't willing to to play in Pullman every other year. So so a lot of uh, WCU fans had a lot of resentment <laughs> right. because Gonzaga was the one that, that stopped playing the series, and you know of course they're they're 80 miles apart, it makes sense to play that game every year, but Mark Few didn't want to do that, so they discontinued the series, and, and so I, I think there's a lot of WC fans who, 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 who've been kind of eager to see the Cougars get another shot at Gonzaga. Obviously, mm-hmm. it's going to be it's going to be a very tough Gonzaga team to beat this year and, and, and probably uh, down the road too. But um, obviously, they're going to they're going to be in the WCC together for for two years, and then they're going to continue that rivalry in the Pac-12. So it's not just the next two years; it's going to be the next, you know, uh, possibly decade, two decades of, of uh, at least two games a year between the Cougs and the Zags. I think in college basketball, you just have to say foreseeable future because right. you just never know. Very true. Um, where do you sit on the fence um, on the on Gonzaga joining the Pac-12? 
Yeah, I think uh, I think once you heard that they were getting uh, essentially a full football share in, in, in terms of revenue, I, I think it really was a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a school that doesn't have a football program, and, and they're getting the same, basically the same amount of money from 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 all the reports that we've heard as. WCU as Boise State, San Diego State. So right. um, I, I, I supposedly that's going to be a huge upgrade uh, from from the WCC in terms of revenue. That's going to help out the athletic department. It's going to help out the school. So um, I, 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 I think at the end it was a no-brainer. It's going to be a very strong uh, basketball conference. It's not going to be as strong as the old Pac-12 was per se. It's not going to be what the Big 12 would have been if Gonzaga had gone there or the Big East. But um, it's going to be a conference with a bunch of teams that, that, uh, that, that have made the tournament in recent years. Obviously, the mm-hmm. Mountain West had... Um, Five, five, maybe six teams last year in the tournament. So, um, San Diego State's made a Final Four national championship game recently. Gonzaga's obviously made two of those. Uh, WC was in the tournament last year. Boise State has, has had a really good um, run under Leon Rice, and, and I, th- I think a lot of people will be really excited to see those games between Leon and Mark. Mark, mm-hmm. uh, Mark is, is kind of known for not scheduling games against his old assistant coaches. That's why Gonzaga's never played Arizona or Boise State, right. even Long Beach State with with Dan Munson. I, I don't see I don't see them playing Eastern Washington anytime soon. So right. uh, now, now the Pac-12 is going to kind of force. Two games a year between Boise State and, and Gonzaga, and I, I think that'll be really fun for for the conference and, and also for both fan bases. Just as a traditional, a fan of traditional college athletics, it makes more sense, right? right. You, you you can you can logically picture Gonzaga in the Big Twelve or the Big East, you know, just because money dictates everything. But if you're looking at it as a fan of college sports, it just makes more sense for them to be playing these geographically uh, geographic region opponents. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, I, I would imagine that Gonzaga fans are more willing to travel to Boise or San Diego for a game than than Ames, Iowa, or, right. or UConn, or <laughs> one of those kind of uh, you know East Coast uh, outposts. So, although they um, don't seem to have any trouble traveling to Las Vegas, <laughs> that's true. No, they, they'll, they'll always get to Vegas for a game, but but it's going to be really really fun to watch them play in some of these road atmospheres. Uh, obviously, you know, every every WCC school that they play um, almost sells out when Gonzaga comes to town, even if it's Portland or Pacific or Pepperdine. So, right. uh, seeing seeing the Zag play at Utah State, which which is known to have a great um, home crowd. Obviously, San Diego State has that. Boise State has that uh, under Leon Rice. So, so that, um, that'll be really fun to see the Zags play in some of those really kind of hostile road atmospheres. And again, playing teams that are going to be top 100 in Kempom, top 150 at the very least, and, 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 and kind of not have to play these teams that are really kind of dragging down their their net rating, their RPI, their, their strength, of, uh, strength of schedule. Um, let's talk about the Zags on the road, because as, as the Spokesman Review beat reporter, you travel with the team. Um, just talk about life on the road, like how arduous it is, um, how fun it is, exhilarating at some points. Uh, you've seen some really interesting basketball games in your tenure, and I'm sure some of them have been less than interesting and more of a, of a, of a pain travel-wise. So just how difficult it is traveling, following the Zags over the winter. Yeah, it's it's really difficult when you have to go to places like Hawaii, you know, for the Maui Invitational, <laughs> and the Bahamas for the Battle for Atlantis, right. and San Diego. It, it's just, uh, uh, I, I I hate it. I can't stand it. No, I'm <laughs> I'm joking. Obviously, it's um, uh, mostly enjoyable. I I really like the travel aspect of the job. Um, I, I I like visiting other um, arenas, whether it's a neutral site game at a place like, you know, Madison Square Garden. I've, I've never mm-hmm. been there for 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 any kind of game, so I I'm excited for that experience and. Um, going to some of these, you know, MTEs, multi-team events, the the, the Thanksgiving week tournaments um, have been really fun too. Just, just kind of seeing the turnout um, at the at the Phil Knight Invitational, the the Maui Invitational last year, and, and, and kind of following the Zags to some of these really cool, uh, uh, cool non-conference. Um, Games, tournaments, et cetera, and then, and then even even the WCC, you know, um, uh, school, schools like Pep, Pepperdine, Portland, Pacific get a lot of flack, maybe, but mm-hmm. um, they, they they really kind of turn out for 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 Gonzaga. So uh, wherever Gonzaga goes, it's it's uh, they they have a target on their back, whether they're number one in the country or or um, you know unranked, uh, top twenty five, whatever whatever it is, um, it's 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 really fun to see. St. Mary's, uh, the packed house there. Mm-hmm. Um, some of these really small gyms, uh, f- you know, kind of fill up and uh, you know create a, <laughs> create a really kind of re- really cool road atmosphere. And um, it gets really hot in some of these buildings. And right. St. Mary's is kind of known for having the slippery floor because I think they exceed the uh, the, the um, what is it the fire capacity fire right. limit. So right. um, it's, it's 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 really fun to follow this team on the road. I, I enjoy the travel. I, I enjoy seeing new places, seeing new arenas, and um, I, I get a little. Uh, 
a little weary by the end of the year, you know, mm-hmm. by 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 uh, by the end of last season, the Sweet 16 in Detroit. Um, I was thinking, yeah, there, there's probably better places to be in, in the country than Detroit in March, but right. um, it is what it is, and, and covering the tournament's the best part of the job, in my opinion, too. So um, it's it's been really fun. Is there one venue that that stands out to you? Like this is like this is my favorite place to go cover the Zags, whether um, whether it's atmosphere or yeah. hospitality or whatever it is. Um, I would say that the best place I've been, and, and obviously Gonzaga doesn't play this this game regularly or play there regularly, but uh, last year at Rep Arena, Lexington, mm-hmm. Kentucky, was sure. um, that's a historic venue. That's a huge venue. It's it's an NBA sized arena. Um, they fill it for every game. It's Kentucky, whether they're playing Gonzaga or Nichols State, you know they're they're, they're going right. to sell out that game. So um, that was a really fun atmosphere. It, it, the hospitality there was great. It's the first time um, I've ever been sitting um, at press row and someone comes and says, hey, can I go and grab you some food? One of the ushers, we get these food vouchers, and I didn't have time to go get food. Sure. Uh, halftime, I'm trying to write. So uh, the usher um, takes my voucher and goes and brings me back a, a barbecue sandwich and chips. Nice. So uh, the hospitality there was 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 really solid. Uh, you know, they, they talk a lot about Southern hospitality in the SEC, and it, it's, a, it's a real thing I can attest now. So um, I really enjoyed uh, not only just uh, that atmosphere arena, but but that was a really fun game that obviously, uh, you know, turned, turned around Gonzaga's season last year. On the contrary, is there a building that you just dread going to again? Yeah, I, uh, you know, again, I said, you know, we, we give Pacific a lot of flack, but I, I think that's probably the one that um, maybe the most, I don't want to say forgettable, but it's, it's probably the one that you that you look forward to going to the least. Uh, you know, nothing <laughs> nothing wrong with it, but Stockton isn't necessarily a, a destination, and, and I can right. say that I grew up uh, about an hour away from Stockton in, in Northern California. My dad worked in Stockton, so it, it's not a place that you go go for vacation per se. But uh, um, there there are a lot of really cool places too in the WCC. So so saying that Pacific is the worst isn't isn't really as much of an, a knock on Pacific as it is just a, kind of a testament to some of the cool places we get to go in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, uh, Malibu is maybe my favorite destination to, to go to in the WCC. Right. The beach, it's it's nice to go go to the beach when it's um, you know 20 degrees and snowing in Spokane in January and you get to travel to Malibu for a couple of days so can't complain about that but um, yeah sorry Pacific you're gonna have to take that one <laughs> has there been an instance where you've been on the road either getting home or, or, or going to and you know you miss connection or, or weather or whatever and you're like you know holy crap I'm not gonna make the game or that type of thing. has there been that situation I can't think of a, a situation where I almost missed a game uh, per se, but um, I, I've had, you know, I mean, if you if you travel as as much as we do, you're going to have delays, uh, canceled flights. Um, I think uh, I think my colleague Jim Meehan had had a bad case of that a few years ago, maybe traveling to Portland. I, I think he might might have got caught up in a snowstorm or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it might have been a couple of years ago uh, when we were traveling to BYU. Um, I think I had the directions wrong for the airport, so we were driving to the airport <laughs> early in the morning with a rental car, and, and I, um, I had the wrong directions, and it took us to somewhere completely different in Salt Lake City, and, and we were a little uh, a little tight on that flight, but, but still made the flight and, and were able to get home. But um, I, I can't think of any examples of, of nearly missing a game now. Gotcha. I was uh, I was going to ask you about life on the road with Meehan. How is he as a, as a travel partner, as a work partner on the road? Great, great, no complaints. Uh, yeah, we, we we always tend to want to go somewhere to watch uh, football games if it's a you know Thursday night NFL game or right. um, other college games on Saturday. We, we we typically can find a place to watch uh, to watch other college games. So he, he's not not a picky eater. I'm not a picky eater. So we, <laughs> we we like to find kind of the closest place that has a bunch of TVs to watch games at. You, when you're on the road, it's easy to get sucked into working every minute you're on the road, right? You're not at home. You're not doing the things you need to do at home. So you're just there. You're working. Um, you you got to find an hour or hour and a half to to go sit and, and open your mind up a little bit or it can drive yeah. you crazy, right? Yeah, I, I, I try to do that, um, especially just knowing that, you know, some of these places I might never go back to. Uh, you know, we, right. we were in Palm Springs for the exhibition game. Um, against USC last week, and and uh, you know we're 30 minutes away from Joshua Tree National Park, so the game's at five. I decided, hey, I've, I've got a few hours before the game, so drove out just to see Joshua Tree National Park. And whether it's going on a hike or just walking around the city, trying to find um, you know local local coffee shops or places like that, j- just to kind of explore a little bit. I, I try to do that and try to get a workout in if I can. You know, I, I'm not not as good during the season sometimes about that, but mm-hmm. if I can just get, you know, 45 minutes to an hour in the in the workout room at the hotel, 
uh, take my mind off everything. That that helps me out. And, and you're also not maybe uh, as as in control of your diet as you want to be on the road. So right. <laughs> that's another reason you need to get into the gym a little bit more. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a balance. And, and I, I think I've learned to, to take a little bit more time for myself and, and try to find those opportunities to, to kind of uh, clear your mind because because it is it is a lot of um, uh, basketball, thinking about basketball, writing mm-hmm. about basketball, wanting to transcribe interviews, get stuff ready for uh, previews or, or whatnot, writing writing on planes, writing writing in the airport. So right. it can be pretty all all, all encompassing. But um, yeah, I, I think I've gotten better at the uh, finding time for myself aspect of it. How did you get into sports writing, and 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 are you where you thought you would be? Um, I well, growing up in in Northern California, I can't say I ever thought I would be in Spokane, Washington. Right. Um, I uh, you know I. I love sports from a young age. I, you know, I, I think uh, the first thing I ever read was the sports section of a newspaper. And um, there's a funny story I always tell people that uh, there was <laughs> one day that I drive, my parents were driving me to school and I, I forgot my shoes, but I remembered to bring the sporting green <laughs> of the local newspaper um, in the car with me. So um, I, I read the sports section every day growing up and, and didn't necessarily you know, know at that time I wanted to, to be a sports writer. But I think once I got into middle school and decided uh, that the professional baseball route was probably not going to happen for me, mm-hmm. um, I was like, well, what can I do in sports that, that, that I would still enjoy? And I was able to, to work for my high school uh, newspaper. I, I say newspaper in air quotes. It was more of like a brochure that came out once a week. Right. But I was the uh, the sports editor of the high school newspaper for one year and, and decided I wanted to, to pursue that, that uh, route. And I uh, went to the University of Idaho for, for sports, for journalism, um, um, I was a communications major there, worked at the student paper there, and, and still kind of uh, enjoyed it by the end, and, and worked for uh, the Lewiston Tribune in college and interned at the Seattle Times. So, so I had a few opportunities to uh, to get some kind of real-world experience and, and enjoyed that enough and um, got to work at the Lewiston Tribune right out of uh, college. That's uh, I think that's a, a, a familiar a refrain from sports writers. It's like, you know, I, I learned how to read reading the sports page. Right. Mine's very similar. My mom was an educator and, um, you know, she would read me the box scores and, and the funnies until I was old enough to do it myself. And um, I, I think um, you fall in love with the written language very mm-hmm. early. I, at least I know I did. Yeah. And I, I, I think that what I tell people is my favorite aspect of this job is the storytelling, getting to know an athlete's story, um, finding that story. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than, than, than other times. But when you find a great story, you're able to share that with readers who, who really care about the, the team, the, the, the athlete. I, I think that's really cool. And um, everyone has a story uh, as to how they got to where they are now. And um, I, I think digging that up and, and being able to share that to, to readers is really fun. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank uh, Theo Lawson for being our guest today, um, talking about all things Zags, and you can follow him all season long at Spokesman.com. And um, Theo, thanks for joining us. Yep. Look forward to coming back on. Awesome. Thanks.